So you want to get on some of that injectable Wolverine healing factor because you've injured yourself doing one of those vanilla Instagram workouts. They cause you more harm than good. And you've heard that BBC 157 has been added to the WADA prohibited list of 2022. And recently, it's even been banned from prescription by US-based compounding pharmacies. And therefore, it must be highly effective, right? Well, I got news for you, buddy. BPC-157 is almost magic when it comes to the healing of injuries. So let's dive right in, shall we? Vigorous Steve here. I'm sure you've already heard about BPC-157, which is a 15 amino acid pentatech peptide partial sequence of body protection compounds discovered in and isolated from human gastric juice, which is naturally occurring in the intestinal tract. BPC-157 is a bioidentical peptide hormone that literally has hundreds of thousands of positive anecdotal reports, mostly in the context of healing connective tissue injuries, but 99% of the scientific evidence surrounding the beneficial effects of BPC-157 treatments are stemming from animal models, mostly performed on various strains of rats. There's just one abandoned human clinical trial and two studies with actual human subjects, one of which I can't even find the full publication, and the other 180 studies or so are either done on in vitro human cells, the large majority though have been performed on animal models. And while this peptide is ever so promising and offers a broad range of positive effects when it comes to the healing of damaged tissues, it is still considered a gray area peptide and it's yet to be fully clinically investigated, FDA approved and marketed for medical use. Nevertheless, BPC-157 has been extensively used by bodybuilders, strongmen, Olympic weightlifters, CrossFit athletes. I mean, without BPC-157, there would be no CrossFit, right? And even general fitness enthusiasts or general population have used BPC-157 to heal tendon and ligament injuries and even to heal the intestinal tract from various gastrointestinal diseases and conditions. So with such a large sample size of positive results in humans, it being bioidentical and all, why is this peptide not part of the public domain for worry-free usage? Before we continue, I want to highlight the insane amount of scientific investigation and work that Dr. Predrag Sikorek from Croatia has performed on BPC-157. Dr. Sikorek is the one who discovered and isolated BPC-157 from human gastric juices in 1993. Him and his research team have performed dozens of various animal studies to investigate the potential benefits of BPC-157. Without Dr. Sikorek's guidance, we would have never known and understood how effective BPC-157 actually is. And nowadays, since this peptide became publicly available, literally hundreds of thousands of athletes are able to heal their injuries properly. Dr. Pedrug Sikorek is the leading scientist involved in the research and development of BPC-157. And on behalf of the entire enhanced fitness community, Vigor Steve salutes you. Let's have a look at the evidence-based beneficial effects of BPC-157. And these are all scientifically proven citations down below, evidence-based with proper citations. Okay, from the start, BPC-157 has anxiolytic effects, analgesic properties, promotes angiogenesis, modulates blood pressure and improves cardiovascular health and blood flow. Now, the modulation of blood pressure and increasing of blood flow might have potential performance enhancing benefits. But to be fair, when you start comparing BPC-157 to other compounds which are known to induce vasodilation, um, I would say that BPC-157 is pretty low on the performance enhancing drug list. There are much more potent compounds out there which will enhance performance acutely. BPC-157 supports the immune system, heals and prevents stomach ulcers reduces intestinal oxidative stress and reduces intestinal and systemic inflammation. It improves wound healing that's in the eyes, skin, tendons, ligaments, connective tissue, bones, cardiac and skeletal muscle and internal organs. BPC-157 improves collagen, fibrin and elastin synthesis. It improves growth hormone receptor density and response in fibroblasts. More on that later. BPC-157 modulates neurotransmitters in the brain, that being dopamine, GABA, opioid, and serotonin neuromodulation. It has neuroprotective effects in the brain, promotes neurogenesis in the brain, which is very similar to the neurogenic effects of human chorionic gonadotropin. 
BBC 157 counteracts cardiac hyperkalemia and arrhythmias. Protects against cancer-induced cachexia, similarly to selective androgen receptor modulators or some of the new myostatin inhibitors, which are all undergoing various stages of clinical trials. BBC 157 has potential antidepressant properties and mitigates the negative effects of certain medications. They're on the screen. There's a lot of them. And it mitigates the negative effects of certain chemicals. Again, all on the screen. Now, this is very important for you to understand with all of these potential benefits of BPC-157. After reviewing all of the scientific literature, I cannot really find an instance where BPC-157 prevents damage to tissues only heals it after it's already been injured. So in the various animal models, they damage or injure the animal first with some of these chemicals on the screen or in various contexts, and they use BPC-157 to heal the damaged tissue. There's only one context where BPC-157 can actually protect uh, certain organs, which is only in the context of developing stomach ulcers, which makes logical sense because body protection compound found in human gastric juice obviously works in the intestinal tract. So if you take a partial sequence, BPC-157 orally, it might be able to prevent the development of stomach ulcers. If you do something wrong, you take something that would otherwise cause stomach ulcers. And that kind of answers the question, if you can run BPC-157 year round to prevent um, tendon and connective tissue injuries, unfortunately, it hasn't been investigated. All of the animal studies damage the animal first, and then BPC-157 is administered in the context of healing the damaged tissue. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any tangible scientific evidence in the animal models that BPC-157 has a proven protective effect in various injury models where BBC-157 administration can protect or somewhat mitigate the damage which would otherwise occur without BPC-157 treatment being in place. Unfortunately, those studies have not been performed, so um, we're going into a little bit of a dubious speculation. Could it potentially have a beneficial effect to prevent injuries from happening? Maybe, maybe, but I don't know anybody personally who runs BBC-157 year-round. And to kind of prove this point, in the latest BBC-157 publication written by Dr. Pridrak Sikarik, posted on April 30th, 2023, titled Stable Gastric Pentadecapeptide BPC-157 May Recover Brain Gut Axis and Gut Brain Axis Function. In here, they basically go over all previous studies performed on BPC-157, and they specifically highlight the beneficial healing effects on various organs in various conditions. If you do a word count for prevent or avoid, you'll find a lot less instances compared to doing a word count on counteract, recovery, or resolve. Right? The citations are down below. Give that article, that publication, a read if you want to get the lowdown on the latest on BBC 157. So again, the only context where BBC 157 prevents injuries is in cases of stomach ulcers. So if you're high on baby aspirin, or you're high on oral steroids, or you're high on oral liquid serums containing a boatload of synthetic solvents, and you didn't take your glutamine to protect your stomach lining, then you now have a legitimate reason to run oral BPC-157 year round. Or you can take the baby aspirin or orals out and just run fish oil or vitamin E for their similarly blood thinning properties. And on the subject of oral BPC-157, since it's a partial sequence of a bioidentical hormone found in the intestinal tract, unlike many other peptides, BPC-157 is orally bioavailable, which can be further enhanced when BPC-157 is combined with sulcoprosate sodium or it's fused to the mucosal surface of the lactic acid bacteria Lactococcus lactis. More on that later. From all the research that I've done and all of the people that I talked to using BPC-157 in various applications, it appears that it's generally well tolerated and the observed negative effects in animal models appear to be minimal as well. That being said, there are no completed human safety studies of BPC-157, and it appears that it's not entirely side effect free. Commonly reported side effects of intramuscular or subcutaneous BPC-157 administrations 
are post-injection pain mostly burning following the administration and sometimes there's redness at the administration sites that might last one or two days. And the rare side effects of oral or injectable BPC-157 include anhedonia, where you can't really feel pleasure or enjoyment in life. That's probably because BPC-157 is known to modulate dopamine and serotonin levels. And extrapolating from the angiogenesis benefits and the wound healing benefits of BPC-157, there could be a potential for cancer progression if cancer is already present in the body. So let's address the anhedonia first because some post-injection pain is just meant to be expected. You're piercing the skin, you're injecting a foreign substance into your body. What do you think was going to happen, right? Some post-injection pain is just part of the game. So let's address the anhedonia, which seems to be one of those rarely reported side effects when it comes to BPC-157, mostly in anecdotal cases found on Reddit. And of course, Reddit is not a very accurate representation of the sample size of all of the people who have used BPC-157 successfully to treat various injuries. And personally, I've never talked to anybody who've used BPC-157 and experienced severe or any kind of anhedonia while running a course to heal injuries. Still, there's a good amount of scientific evidence, mostly stemming from the animal models, where BPC-157 was shown to interact with various neurotransmission systems, including a dopaminergic, serotonergic, GABAergic, and opioid neurotransmission in the brain, so we might as well address it going forward. BPC-157 may counteract, not prevent, counteract the consequences of dopamine-related neuronal damage, dopamine vesicle depletion, dopamine receptor blockades, and the consequences of reduced dopaminergic activity. So all of that combined, I would say, has a positive net outcome if there's a certain medication or practice in place where dopaminergic neurotransmission is somewhat impaired. But when it comes to serotonergic neurotransmission, it seems that BPC-157 reduces serotonin synthesis in the dorsal thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus, and the lateral geniculate, while in the substantia nigra reticulate and medial anterior olfactory nucleus, the serotonin synthesis was enhanced. No change was observed in the RAF nuclei. So long story short, putting that all together, BBC-157 might enhance or impair serotonin synthesis in particular parts of the brain. And considering these serotonergic modulating effects, BBC-157 might actually have antidepressant-like properties, which is also confirmed in several studies where they compared BBC-157 to other antidepressants, right? Again, all in animal models. So unfortunately, those animals can't report how they feel. That's why, that's why there might be some discrepancy between how BBC-157 acts in animals versus humans. It's also important to note that BBC-157 might actually lower the positive effect of dopaminergic stimulants like modafinil or Adderall. So keep this in mind, if you start combining various compounds for various purposes, there might be some drug interactions regarding neurotransmission and overall cognitive function. Another study showed that BPC-157 counteracted ketamine-induced cognitive dysfunction, social withdrawal, and anhedonia, and exerted additional anxiolytic effects. And all of the citations are down below in case you experience anhedonia yourself if you do run a BBC treatment to heal various injuries. Personally, I've never talked to anybody who experienced anhedonia while running BBC-157. I didn't experience that myself, and I've run a BBC-157 many a time to heal injuries for four to six weeks in duration. Still, there's a good amount of scientific evidence that you can review. And if you experience anhedonia, besides the neurotransmission optimization stack, which I discussed in the Entrepreneur Deep Dive video series, and otherwise look into agmatine sulfate or 9-methyl beta-carboline, 9-MEBC, which might offer you some relief. And regarding cancer progression, while there is some scientific evidence that shows that BBC-157 can protect against cancer-induced cachexia, stomach lesions caused by chemotherapy drugs, and a radiation-induced liver injury, there's some speculation in the medical community that BBC-157 treatments might actually accelerate cancer growth. And it's a bit of a double-edged sword because BPC-157 might protect against cancer through its antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and immunosupportive effects, while its angiogenic effects, its effects on wound healing, and its known effects regarding the increase of growth hormone receptor density in fibroblasts might actually grow pre-existing cancer faster. 
But the scientific evidence is extremely thin when it comes to this aspect. BBC 157 hasn't been directly investigated in its effects on certain cancers. So if you're worried, look into your genetic makeup. Do a 23andMe. Look into your family history. Do some full body organ imaging with ultrasounds or MRIs. And you can always check your cancer markers through blood work. Right, you should do that anyway if you're interested in running peptides like PPC157 that includes TB500, epithalon, growth hormone, insulin, IGF-1, and also carterine. And before we go any further, look into all of the juicy beneficial effects of BPC-157 since it's been added to the World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list of 2022. And there's now somewhat reliable testing methods out there for urinary BPC-157 metabolites. Let's dive into the possible evidence-based detection times. So you as an athlete can still use BPC-157, heal all of your injuries and still win the competition. For your information, I was not able to find a single case in any sport where a athlete failed the doping test for BPC-157. There's a single news article out there where the UFC flyweight veteran Courtney Casey received a four month ban from MMA after self-reporting a prohibited substance being BPC-157. This was done on uh, June 21st of 2023. So that's reasonably new. And that's all I was able to find. Now the Summer Olympics are going to be held this year in July and August. I'm sure the doping cases for BPC-157 will go up after that. Usually around the Summer Olympics, they start rolling out new testing parameters for various drugs that they have uh, now more scrutinous, more accurate tests for. Let's look into the scientific evidence. There's three papers I want to highlight. Unfortunately, there's no clear established detection times for BPC-157 yet, but there's still some scientific evidence we can review. So let's dive right into it. This study shows that confiscated BPC-157 when added to human urine at room temperature and four degrees Celsius at a concentration of two milligrams per one milliliter, so that's a pretty high concentration, formed stable metabolites and it remained detectable for at least four days. Unfortunately, this study didn't investigate what happens after those four days. So based on this study, we can say that BPC-157 has at least four day detection time, right? It's BPC-157 and it's stable metabolites. The studied detection method had a detection limit of 0.1 nanograms per milliliter with a precision of less than 20%. But six years later, in another study performed in October 2023, so this is a lot more recent, they showed a satisfactory detection limit of 0.01 to 0.11 nanograms per milliliter. So as time goes on, they're able to detect lower and lower and lower concentrations of the five main metabolites of BPC-157 after it's been added to human urine. Both of these studies did not investigate the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics of BPC-157 when it's administered through intramuscular administration or subcutaneous administration, intraarticular administration, or even intravenous administration, if that's even being done. Right? I would assume that BPC-157 primarily metabolizes in the body and not urine, even though the detection is obviously going to be through urine analysis. So besides these two studies, which don't really investigate normal administrations of BPC-157, right? These are in vitro studies, but maybe this last study can give us some insights. Again, it's an animal model, so take it all with a grain of salt. BPC-157 remained detectable in the urine of rats following a single intramuscular administration of 100 micrograms per kilogram of body weight for at least three days. Unfortunately, no follow-up after those initial three days. So now we know that BP-7157 and its metabolites is detectable when added to human urine for four days and following conventional administration, again, in animal models, in rats, it's detectable for at least three days. Can't really work much with that at all. So to play it safe, since BPC-157 offers no tangible or acute effects on performance, it's not a performance enhancing drug. It mostly aids in the recovery of damaged tissue. It's a healing peptide. So use it for that and that alone. I would recommend you to stop the oral or injectable BPC-157 at least one month before a competition where you expect 
to be drug tested. But if you're also subject to drug testing out of competition or in season, but it's random, then I would advise you not to run BPC-157 because we now know that the detection time is at least three to four days, if not longer. And otherwise look into the enhanced games where there's no oversight from bullies. All right, with that out of the way, let's have a look at the extremely limited human studies performed on BPC-157, starting with the only human clinical trial in existence to date, which was canceled, unfortunately. Performed by Pharmacotherapy in October 2015, titled PCO-02, which is another name for BPC-157 when compounded, a safety and pharmacokinetics trial. This was a phase one pilot study in healthy volunteers to assess the safety and pharmacokinetics of PCO-02, which active ingredient is BPC-157. Uh, healthy volunteers received a single dose of either one milligram, three milligrams, or six milligrams oral BPC-157 on an empty stomach during phase 1A. Phase 1B included three milligrams oral BPC-157 three times daily following a meal for a total of 14 days. So the total daily intake was nine milligrams oral BPC-157 for up to two weeks. Unfortunately, it appears that this clinical trial has been canceled or discontinued sometime during the investigation and the results were never published. If you do know why this particular uh, clinical trial was canceled, please let me know down below in the comment section. I would like to know why. Also, there's one actual human study in existence that we have full access to, performed by Edwin Lee and Blake Paget, published on July 2021, titled Intraarticular Injections of BPC-157 for Multiple Types of Knee Pain. This is a retrospective study where the researchers offered patients suffering from various types of knee pain for prolonged periods of time, the experimental and non-FDA-approved peptides BPC-157. In the beginning of the trial, they also offered thymosin beta-4, not its partial sequence TB500, thymosin beta-4 in combination with BPC-157 because both of these peptides have anti-inflammatory properties. Later on, they removed or they didn't offer thymosin beta-4 and they just solo continued with BPC-157. As the researchers noted that patients were improving with both peptides. Keep in mind that this is without co-administration of anything that can enhance collagen synthesis. So there's no collagen type 1, 2, 3, 4 supplementation in place, no vitamin C supplementation in place, no hyaluronic acid, no growth hormone or growth hormone secretagogues, no oxandrolone or other anabolic androgenic steroids, which could enhance collagen synthesis, no GHK copper, just thymosin beta-4 for four patients in the beginning of the trial and not even TB500. So basically the entirety of this study is based on BPC-157 solo with small amount of scientific evidence that proves that a combination of BPC-157 with thymosin beta-4, again, not TB-500, has a beneficial effect on the healing of knee pain. 16 patients completed the study, of which there were nine women, 56%, seven men, 44%, age 19 to 77 years old, with an average age of 60 years old. So most of the patients were basically seniors. Thymosin beta-4 and BPT-157 were sourced from tailor-made compounding, so we know the peptides were 100% legit. Patients received either 4 milligrams per 2 milliliters BPC-157 or 2 milligrams per 1 milliliter to 4 milligrams per 2 milliliters BPC-157 plus 3 milligrams per 1 milliliter to 6 milligrams per 2 milliliters thymosin beta-4 injected directly into the knee joint. So these investigated dosages are a little bit higher, albeit less frequent, compared to what's generally being used in injury healing protocols, which usually revolve around 500 micrograms to 1 milligram BPC-157 plus 500 micrograms to 1 milligram TB500 injected as close to the site of injury as possible, usually in combination with anything that is known to improve healing and improve collagen synthesis. So that's the anivore, the growth hormone, growth hormone secreted gogs, GHK copper, uh, collagen supplements, etc., etc., etc. But again, those were not used in this study. Patients were contacted between six months to one year after the BBC 157 or BBC 157 plus times and beta 4 administration. In the group of patients who received only BPC-157, 11 out of 12 people had improvement in their knee pain. So that's 92%.
Of the patients who received the BBC157 Plus Times and Beta 4, three out of four people had improvement in their knee pain, so that's 75%. Overall, 14 out of 16 patients, that's 87.5%, had improvement in their knee pain following the treatment with either BBC157 Solo or in combination with Dymosin Beta 4. Most patients reported improvements after three to six months following the treatment. And while there were four patients who did an MRI before starting the peptide experiment, unfortunately, no follow-up MRIs were performed on the exact same patients who experienced knee pain relief or improvement after the peptide experiment concluded. So we can't say with 100% certainty that these peptides actually healed the knee injuries over time, or that the anti-inflammatory effects of BPC-157 or thymosin beta-4 actually improved the knee pain discomfort to the point it no longer hurt. I mean, that can be the case. Also, keep in mind that various kinds of knee injuries usually revolve themselves over time. There's no control group, a same sample size of a similar amount of people that also experienced knee pain that got a placebo administered intra-articularly, right? The normal saline solution, for example. And then maybe they experienced knee pain improvement over three to six months as well. Right? That control hasn't been performed in this study, unfortunately. But this is the only, and therefore it's the best, human study that we have on BPC-157. And since the outcome is positive, I can't really complain too much. It does show that particular injuries will improve over time. So let's have a look at some of the animal studies and highlight all of the unique characteristics of BPC-157. If you do a search for body protection compound or BPC-157, you get about 180 studies as a result. So in order to respect your time, I'm just going to highlight the most notable ones with the interesting factoids beyond what is commonly known of BPC-157. First study I want to highlight, titled Pentadecapeptide BBC157 Enhances the Growth Hormone Receptor Expression in Tendon Fibroblasts, performed by Chung et al. The results of this study showed that BBC157 increased the growth hormone receptor gene expression in BBC157-treated tendon fibroblasts in the Achilles tendon of male sprog dolly rats and that the combination of BBC-157 and exogenous growth hormone increased cell proliferation within the tendon fibroblasts in a dose and time-dependent fashion. So if you want to heal tendon issues, it makes logical sense to combine that with growth hormone for the entire time that you're undergoing a BBC-157 treatment, because there's clearly scientific evidence that proves that there's a synergistic effect between BBC-157 and growth hormone when it comes to the healing of tendon injuries. That being said, I can't find any scientific evidence that shows the exact same thing when it comes to skeletal muscle or bones. So we know, again, proven with scientific evidence that the BBC-157 treatment in the Achilles tendon can increase growth hormone receptor gene expression, but anywhere else, um, those studies have yet to be performed. And when those studies will be performed, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, eventually, maybe then we can make a better decision regarding BPC-157, running that synergistically alongside a growth hormone exogenously, um, and maybe we can get more bang for our buck instead of uh, continuously increasing our growth hormone dosages. Um, again, talking to many a people in the field who use BPC-157 and exogenous growth hormone, I can't say that I've talked to anybody who suddenly noticed an increase in fullness, lipolysis, uh, recovery, growth, etc. when they start stacking BBC-157 when they're with their pre-existing exogenous growth hormone use, right? Only in the context of healing injuries, it's not going to make you grow like magic, unfortunately. And this animal study shows the angiogenesis benefits of BPC-157 performed by CA et al. titled Therapeutic potential of pro-angiogenic BBC-157 is associated with VEGFR2 activation and upregulation. This study shows that BBC-157 treatment enhances vascular expression of vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2 in animal models as well as in human in vitro studies hum using human vascular endothelial cells. So it's not very close to an actual human study, but at least they used some human cells in vitro, proving the exact same thing, that this is uh, one of the main pathways in which BBC-157 increases angiogenesis. Moving over to another study performed by Deke et al. titled BBC-157 is a potential treatment for fluorona. 
um, again, this is extrapolating from all of the scientific evidence that is uh, performed in animal models on BPC-157 because uh, BPC-157 is anti-inflammatory, cytoprotective, immunomodulatory, normotensive, that's the modulation of blood pressure, endothelial protective effects in different organ systems in animal models. It was speculated that BPC-157 might be a novel agent in the management or resolvement of fluorona, and whether that's long hauler syndrome or acute fluorona, um, I think it's worthy of exploring. Again, all of the citations are down below. Another study I want to highlight, performed by Skrillek et al., uh, engineering recombinant Lactococcus lactis as a delivery vehicle for BBC157 peptides with antioxidant activities. So besides this uh, particular sodium that some of the compounding pharmacies use in a combination with BBC157, um, when BBC157 was fused with a mucosal surface of the lactic acid bacteria Lactococcus lactis, it significantly increased the amount of BBC157, which was delivered to cells within the intestinal tract. This enhanced delivery method significantly decreased reactive oxygen species and production um, and should offer uh, additional benefits with patients suffering from irritable bowel syndrome. Unfortunately, this particular combination is not readily available, but maybe at one point in time, uh, when more human clinical trials have been performed, this uh, bacterial prodrug of BBC-157 might become available, and then a lot of people suffering from IBS or other intestinal issues might be able to resolve their symptoms more effectively, and otherwise look into formulations containing sulcoprosate sodium. So what is the most effective dose for BBC-157? when it's run solo. Well, for soft tissue injuries, based on all of the scientific evidence that we just reviewed together, a dose anywhere between 200 micrograms to 1,000 micrograms BPC-157 injected either subcutaneously, intramuscularly, or intra-articularly, at least as close to the site of injury as possible for a duration of, let's say, four to six weeks, um, ideally in combination with BBC-157 or thymosin beta-4, growth hormone or growth hormone secretagogues, GHK copper, collagen peptides, vitamin C, hyaluronic acid, even silica, which has been shown to improve collagen synthesis. Whatever you can do to improve healing further beyond the BBC-157 treatment, take every chance you can get. All right, that being said, um, if you need surgery, get the surgery out of the way first because those tendons are not magically going to grow together, right? Even though it's the Wolverine healing peptides, unfortunately, reality doesn't work that way. If the tendons are torn, you need surgery to put everything back together and then you can start the treatment with various peptides, one of which being BBC-157. And if you suffer from um, intestinal problems, right, intestinal injuries, whether that's irritable bowel syndrome or something else, stomach ulcers, for example, then anywhere between 250 micrograms to 500 micrograms orally once or twice per day. So that's a total between 250 micrograms to 1,000 micrograms oral BBC-157 every single day until the injuries internally within the intestinal tract are resolved. And that's in, ideally in combination with uh, the antimicrobial peptide LL37, KPV, glutamine, probiotics, prebiotics, fiber, and following an elimination diet. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that following an elimination diet first before adding in um, you know, these kinds of peptides to heal the intestinal tract is probably the way to go because you need to address it by the root cause. Whatever is causing you the stomach ulcers or the irritable bowel syndrome, uh, remove that first and then you can start healing whatever was wrong. Based on the animal models, it seems that intramuscular BBC-157 administration have a half-life anywhere between 15 minutes to 30 minutes. The uh, compound isn't detectable in serum four hours after intramuscular administrations, um, but anecdotally it's reported that BBC-157 has a half-life of between two to six hours, but this is not confirmed anywhere in the literature. So if it's not detectable within serum within four hours, you would say that it has a very short half-life. Um, even though it's detectable in urine for three to four days, it might still be detectable longer. But I think that highly depends on the administration route because still a lot of people out there are going to take BBC-157 subcutaneously. Again, I'll link this study down below. Very interesting read regarding the pharmacokinetics and dynamics 
of BBC 157. So based on this data, I would advise you to split up your daily dose of BBC 157 into two administrations because the half-life based on intramuscular administrations is so short because you want these healing properties, the anti-inflammatory effects, the wound healing, the increase in collagen synthesis, everything else um, to be continuous so you can heal as fast as possible. That being said, how you should use BP757 in combination with other healing peptides kind of depends on the injury. I have various different videos about this topic, about how to heal tendon and connective tissue injuries. I'll link them down below. And I also have various topics on how to heal uh, injuries and issues with your intestinal tract, also linked down below. So anecdotally, uh, most of the injuries will go away within a four to eight week period. It might mean that you only need a four week treatment of BPC-157, whether that's injectable or oral, um, but the injury might not resolve itself entirely within the duration that you're undergoing BBC 157 treatment. So you need to be patient. I would recommend anybody to do the injectables for maybe four to six weeks and similarly for the orals. If it doesn't resolve uh, completely, give it some time. Just wait a little bit. It might still take a little bit more time, a couple more weeks before all the injuries are completely gone. Right? You still need to stay on top of your nutrition during this time, whether that's for um, connective tissue injuries or internal issues, because nutrition is ultimately going to be the foundation of your recovery process. Without eating nutritious foods, you're not going to heal. Now, the anti-inflammatory and pro-angiogenic effects of BP-7157, again, might take some time to really set in. So keep this in mind while you're undergoing a healing protocol. Eventually, if you're diligent about it, your injuries are going to heal, but there's probably a delayed response from the anti-inflammatory and pro-angiogenic effects of BP-7157. So if it's not getting better acutely, just remember time heals all wounds, be patient, and things will work themselves out eventually. I want to highlight one more thing before we close off this video, and that's the problem with the United States Food and Drug Administration. Here we can see that at the end of September, beginning of October in 2023, so that's only a couple months ago, the United States Food and Drug Administration has limited the way peptides can be prescribed by US-based compounding pharmacies under Section 503A. Besides BPC-157, they also limited prescription of anti-obesity drug 9604, LL37, a CJC1295, a growth hormone secretagogue, Dihexa, a nootropic, Delta sleep inducing peptide, abbreviated to DSIP, a sleep promoting peptide, Epithalon, anti aging drug, GSK copper, injectable but not topical, a topical is still available on Amazon, and the growth hormone secretagogues GHRP2, GHRP6, MK67, and Ipomorelin. Kispeptin 10, um, it's now largely been replaced with clomid or enclomiphene. Uh, Kispeptin 10 didn't really work, in my opinion and from my experience. KPV is uh, banned, melanotan 2 is banned, pigelated mechano growth factor, banned mitochondrial derived uh, peptide MOTS C, banned Salank, Samax, Thymosin Alpha 1, Thymosin Beta 4, but not TB500, and a few other peptides which aren't commonly used by the enhanced fitness community. You can see how absurd this bill is and how little time they actually put into this bill because when you scroll down to BBC 157, and I quote, compounded drugs containing BBC 157 may pose risk for immunogenicity for certain rounds of administration and may have complexities with regards to peptide-related impurities and active pharmaceutical ingredient characterization. Food and Drug Administration has identified no or only limited safety-related information to proposed routes of administration. Thus, we lack sufficient information to know whether the drug would cause harm when administered to humans. And that's not entirely true because there is one study at least out there who investigated um, the safety of BBC-157. And when you start scrolling through all of the peptides which are now limited from prescription, you see that this exact same text is copy-pasted everywhere. So how much effort did it really put into this bill? Zero. Now, that being said, most of these peptides do lack human clinical safety data, so they're correct about that. Um, unfortunately, it's not the case for everything because some of these peptides are well investigated in animal models, um, usually to a much greater extent of prescription medications who are still approved. Well, let's not go down that route. Moving these peptides to category two makes it more difficult to prescribe them. They're not banned 
entirely, but it just means that the United States Food and Drug Administration can take a regulatory action against compounding pharmacies or prescribing physicians if they do a prescribe them to patients. Uh, since there's no established clinical guideline for these peptides uh, through completed clinical trials, prescription is basically impossible at this time. But apparently, technically, these peptides are not illegal yet because there's no pharmaceutical company that holds the patent for these peptides. Again, Pharmacotherapia tried to complete a clinical trial, but that was canceled. So there's no pharmaceutical BBC 157 out there on the market yet. But I'm sure at one point in time, pharmaceutical companies will see all of the potential benefits of these peptides, including BBC 157, human clinical trials will be performed. And then after a multitude of clinical trials shows that BBC 157 and some of the, uh, these other peptides are effective and safe, um, then I'm very sure that they will no longer be available on the gray area peptide websites or through compounding pharmacies unless it's uh, branded from the pharmaceutical company that actually holds the patent, which is uh, basically we can look into the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists when it comes to the generics. First, they were available through the compounding pharmacies, but then Nova Nordisks and Eli Lilly started lobbying, and uh, now they're no longer to be found anywhere. And as a result of that, um, these other peptides are also added to this bill, what was it, 503 a, unfortunately. So again, uh, for now, you're going to have to source this stuff um, through the gray area peptide websites. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve, Vigor's crew. You guys know what to do. A frontable bastard for you guys. I mean, I've done so many BPC 157 administrations in my years because I train way too hard for my own good. And I do have some nagging injuries here and there. Um, but every time I ran BPC 157, um, things turned out for the better a couple weeks later. So BPC 157 is 100% Vigor Steve approved. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.